Hello, my name is Paul Fenton. I'm an orthopaedic trauma surgeon in Birmingham. In this video, we're going to discuss the key points for surgical success when performing a distal tibial fracture fixation with the Synthes Expert Tibial Nail using a frame assisted technique and a super patella approach and utilizing blocking wires to facilitate fracture reduction. The purpose of this short talk is to highlight the key steps to performing a distal tibial nailing successfully and it should be used in conjunction with reading the orthorical surgical technique. There are many more steps of course to the procedure than those outlined and a familiarity with the principles of iron nailing of long bones is assumed. The complete detail that you need is on the orthorical platform and this talk is based on the information there. The first step is careful case selection. The majority of distal tibial fractures will be managed surgically to align and stabilise the limb and allow early weight bearing and joint mobilisation. All of these injuries require a CT scan preoperatively as many seemingly type A extraarticular injuries actually have extension into the joint which is not apparent on plain x-ray. The surgical fixation options include plate fixation, ring fixation or intramedullary nailing. The choice of fixation involves assessment of the injured limb, of the patient and particularly the soft tissues and a careful review of available imaging. IM nailing is indicated when there is sufficient bone stock in the distal segment to adequately lock the nail with preferably three multiplane locking screws and this will be dependent on the specification of the particular nail being used. The advantages of nailing are that it allows immediate weight bearing and requires minimal soft tissue dissection. Fracture patterns with simple splits extending into the joint can be adequately managed with nailing and augmentation with independent screws across the articular block. Contraindications to nailing include patients who wish to avoid anterior knee pain, for instance, for occupational reasons, and those with severe soft tissue injuries precluding any internal fixation in whom ring fixation with a circular frame is likely to be a better option. The second step is the setup. I personally find it easier to use a radiolucent table which allows good access for imaging. It's sensible to check the rotational profile of the contralateral uninjured limb before starting the case to ensure that the correct matching rotational profile is restored intraoperatively. All trauma patients have a social scrub before formal skin prep which is then done to the mid-thigh level. As with most trauma operations, I do not use a tourniquet, but this is particularly important for tibial nailing, where the rema can generate heat, which can result in thermal necrosis. Once the patient is set up, we apply the half frame. This is made up from a layer of components, including femoral arches. Tensioned wires are placed in the proximal tibia and the calcaneum. It is important that these are inserted with the correct orientation which will then allow restoration of the rotational alignment. Generally this means that the wires should be parallel with the floor when the leg is aligned and with the knee and the foot facing the ceiling. This means that once the leg is mounted in the frame that the rotation and length will be restored and the frame thus acts as an extra assistant during the nailing making it far easier and affording good access for AP and lateral imaging without the need to move the leg again. Once the leg is mounted we then make our initial decision. To start with I mark the patella and the long axis of the tibia with a surgical marker. The incision is then placed a thumb's breadth above the superior pole of the patella in line with the long axis of the limb and approximately 2 cm in length. If the patellofemoral joint is particularly tight and it's difficult to insert the trocar, then this can be extended laterally and a minimal lateral release of the patella performed to allow safe passage of the trocar. Once the trocar is in position, the trochlear will tend to guide the trocar onto the proximal tibial entry point. The guide wire is then inserted through the trocar. Angulation of the guide wire can easily be corrected by simply moving one's hand and controlling the trocar. If any translation, translational correction of the guide wire is required, 
Then a second guard wire can be inserted through the trocar using the parallel guide. The next step is to place the reaming wire. I tend to use the bevel tip from the Synream set to advance the reaming wire and allow it to negotiate the fracture. Once we're at the fracture site, an assistant can correct any residual translation at the fracture site with simple manipulation. It's important that the reaming wire is placed in the centre of the distal and proximal metaphyses before reaming is commenced. To ensure that a correct central channel is reamed and this then allows correction of limb alignment once the nail is inserted. To facilitate this we can use blocking wires. Often it's difficult to get the reaming wire positioned centrally in the distal segment and here the use of a blocking wire to guide the reaming wire is a helpful adjunct. I prefer to use a 2.5mm wire rather than place a blocking screw as the use of a wire allows easier adjustment if it's not quite in the correct position. First the reaming wire is retracted proximally to just above the intended wire position. Then the blocking wire is placed on the concave side of the deformity within the distal segment. The reaming wire can then be re-advanced using the bevel guide past the blocking wire, which then pushes the reaming wire into the centre of the intramedullary canal. Wires can be placed in both planes to ensure good positioning of the reaming wire and achieve a central position on both the AP and lateral imaging. Once we're happy with the position of the reaming wire, we can then commence reaming. During reaming, it's essential to always control the guide wire. Loss of the position, having carefully placed it within the distal segment, tends to be a disappointing moment. I only introduce the power tool onto the reaming rod once it's been mounted on the guide wire. The reamer is then advanced. If it's a struggle to pass the blocking wire with the reamer, one can either exaggerate the deformity to help the reamer pass, or even reposition the blocking wire slightly to allow room for the reamer to pass. When retracting the reamer, the guide wire must again be controlled. Once the reamer head is pulled back into the proximal metaphysis, the power tool can be disconnected and the reaming rod removed in a controlled fashion by hand. On completion of reaming, the nail is inserted. This should be as atraumatic as possible and involve only gentle use of the hammer. If the nail won't advance, there's usually a reason other than insufficient use of force, and this needs to be identified. Often, the nail needs to be carefully guided past the cortex. Occasionally, it will be necessary to ream to a slightly larger size. At times, the nail will get stuck on the blocking wire in the distal segment, and this may need to be repositioned, or even a second wire placed in a new position to allow the nail to pass. The final part of the procedure is to lock the nail. For distal tibial fractures, I would aim to place three screws in at least two planes. For a slick insertion, use the knife, then drill, and have the depth gauge to hand before the drill is removed to avoid losing the drill hole. The depth gauge also makes a good soft tissue retractor as the screw is inserted. One doesn't always need to replace the blocking wire with a blocking screw if good fixation in multiple planes is achieved with the locking bolts, but do consider replacing the wire with the screw if there's metaphyseal comminution or poor bone quality.